Today I want to begin a, a series that's going to be a two-week series. This week, next week, that will set up, that is the prophetic word that God wants your pastor to speak into your life over the next two weeks to prepare you for Elevate Month. To prepare you for the voices that are coming from outside of this house into this house. Are you ready to be prepared? Say amen. amen. I have told you and I've told you and I've told you to take ownership of the moment. I want you to speak that over yourself right now. I take ownership of this moment. Not just your moment, because you have a moment too. But your moment is a part of the bigger picture moment. There is a moment that is happening right now. And I know that's, you know, when you really get right down to it, there's every day there is a moment. But it ain't just that something is happening. There are things happening in the spirit realm in this generation that we certainly at least have never seen. There are agendas going on behind the scenes to stop this moment. There is darkness that is creeping in all over this world. I'm talking about on a level that would blow your mind that if I told you facts, just facts, and I will in the coming months and, and even years if the Lord tarries as we go through this journey, if I just told you the facts that are absolutely 1,000% provable, not theory, that you would think that they were conspiracy theory. You would think that it was the mind of somebody that had tenfold wrapped around their head. Are y'all hearing me? Looking for little green men in the backyard. You would, the world would have you to equate the speaking of those facts, not hypotheticals, facts that are undeniably true, you would not be able to even believe that they are true because they are so out of what you are being told and programmed. And these agendas are working for one agenda, not to put a particular candidate in the White House or keep another one out, but to stop the remnant. Are y'all hearing me? Because we, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Are you hearing me? We are a part of a moment that the enemy is going over time to stop us. Because the truth is, the enemy can use a Democrat or a Republican. The Democrat, I mean, excuse me, <laughs> that was not a slip. He could use a Democrat or a Republican. He's got forces on both sides of those aisles. He's got, he's got workers in pulpits. The Bible says, did you not know that the devil himself can be transformed into an angel of light? You better know the word. You better know what you believe. And you better have the Holy Ghost so that you can have the gift of discernment. So, say it one more time. I take ownership. Of this moment. It is yours. It is your time. But you will miss it if you don't take ownership. So as I'm studying this. And I'm thinking about the moment. And I'm praying about the moment. Because I knew that God had told me. That he's going to give me a word for two weeks. To get us ready for Pastor Frankie. And those other voices that are coming. And God said this. Here's how they'll miss the moment. If they. If they don't understand, and you're not going to know how to process this at the beginning, but by the end of this message you will. If they don't understand this command, work while it is day, for the night comes when no man can work. You've heard me quote that over and over again. But if they do not get the concept, 
that you have to do the work in the day. Because the darkness, it makes it more difficult to do the same job in the darkness. You can do it in the darkness, but when it's daytime, you can go out and do what God has called you to do, and you don't need nobody else to shine a flashlight to help you see what you're doing. You can do it. But when it's dark, you can still do it. But you are relying upon the light of others to help illuminate you. And you need that. But listen to me. The, the remnant is small. In order for the remnant to be able to do what it's supposed to do, it's going to get smaller and smaller and smaller and more focused. But God said you can work in the dark, but it's much easier to work now in the day. Are y'all hearing me? Because the remnant will get smaller the darker it gets. Because it's harder to see the path when it's dark. And those that are not solid in their faith, those that the Word of God is not lighting a path for them, will get lost and will wander off. But if we do the work, Okay, all right, I got to go, I got to go. Here we go, you ready? Somebody shout, do the work. Do the work. Whew, that was a good shout, I'm proud of y'all. That sounded awesome. Y'all are paying attention. So I got to thinking about things in Scripture when it comes to the moment, when it comes to work. See, we are so afraid to talk about works in the church. Because of one scripture, we're not saved by works, lest any man should boast, but by the grace of God. We're so afraid to preach there's work to be done. Because, oh, bless God, this ain't about works. You can't earn your salvation. Ain't nobody said that. The same people that don't want you to think that you are saved by your works, lest any man should boast. And that's true. You can't earn your salvation. That's true. Don't ever like to talk about faith without works is dead. But it's more than just those two scriptures. The Bible said Paul said do the work of an evangelist. It's work to be an evangelist. Because an evangelist reaps the harvest. You don't get wheat just by looking at it. Are you hearing me? You don't get a harvest just by walking out and looking at it and going, Woo, look at my harvest. No, you've got to go out and reap the harvest. And then, just because you reap the harvest, don't mean you get to have bread. You've got to thresh the wheat. Are y'all hearing me? There's all kinds of work. That has to be done to eat the bread. Yeah. Are y'all hearing me? So I, I, God took me to a very, very famous story. Because remember I told you, there are stories like David and Goliath, like, like Psalm 23, like some of the most famous things in Scripture that you literally know has been preached thousands upon millions of times in the history of 2,000 years around the world in multiple languages that God is going to show things to people in those scriptures that blows their mind. And none of them will be adding or taking away anything. Because I don't want your revelation if you got to make the word say something that it didn't say. Because that ain't a revelation. An illumination and a revelation of God's word is when you see it undeniably in the Word of God. Because you, you can get mad at me and disagree with me if what I said was my opinion. You could still get mad at me and disagree with me if what I said was in line upon line in Scripture, but you know what? I ain't worried about you. 
Because you're going to have to stand before God because you disagree with Him, not me. Are y'all ready for some word? John chapter 9. John chapter 9. You will, you will recognize this story. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was what? Blind from birth. And his disciples asked him saying, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works, the what? The works of God should be revealed in him. Verse 4. Whole new concept of this verse now. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. I love my church, y'all. You can't preach in this church. You need to get out of the business. Come on. See, we quote that about us. But Jesus said it about himself. And how many knows I've told you once, I've told you a hundred times, he didn't do anything, say anything as God who happened to be man. He did it and said it because he is man. He, was, he did it as man who happens to be God. Hey, y'all going to be glad y'all on the front row today. Y'all, y'all be like, I'm going to slide in. Don't, don't let nobody even notice me. And what does the pastor do? The first thing he does is point him out. I told him, I went to, well, why'd you do that? proud of y'all. Hey, it's okay. It's okay. I'm gonna be, I'll be good for you. I'll be good for you. If I spit, I'll come back here and spit. I, I won't go down there and spit. I'll be good. You'll be glad. You'll be glad. Hey, big time men and women, remnant women, men and women of God sit on the front row. Alright, because they ain't scared. Alright, here we go. Here we go. Y'all ready? Jesus said, I got to do this while I'm here. And as long as I'm here, I'm the light of the world. See, the light he was talking about was himself. But how many knows it wasn't long after that they crucified him. It wasn't long after that they put his body in the tomb that he came back from the dead. And 40 days later, he ascended to heaven and disappeared in the cloud. What happened to the light? The light didn't go up there. He didn't leave us in darkness. He said, everything I am and everything I do, these works shall you. These what? These works shall you do. And greater shall you do if I go to my father. Another scripture he says, looks at his disciples and he looks at the people and says, you are the light of the world. You don't get it yet, but you will get it. You don't take what is happening in you and hide it under a bushel. Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. Now, woo, y'all, it's about to get crazy, y'all. I get crazy. Because this, I'm telling you, when this stuff happens to me, I literally have to step back and go, what? And I literally tell myself, it's so unbelievable how simple these things are that jump out, that I literally tell myself, I read that wrong. I had to have read that wrong. And I read it again, and I read it again, and I read it again. I'm like, how in the world? Spoke to me. How in the world? Now listen, we gotta, this, this, we gotta understand that we have come to the kingdom for this moment. We are the light of the world because we have Jesus in us, right? We have work to do. Somebody shout, we have work to do. Jesus said, these works shall you do. Jesus said, work while it is day. 
He said, I must do this, and I am the light of the world. So if he said, I must do the work, and I am the light of the world, and then he says, you are the light of the world, guess what comes with the light? Work. Work is not a curse. Some people think work was the curse of the garden. He was already working. Work is not a curse. Work is a blessing. Work is an identification. Work is you doing something with your hands that gives you a sense of satisfaction. But it is also actually an act of dominion. Taking authority over something. Providing. It's a, it's a pattern of, of systems of provision. The curse was simply, you were already tilling the land, and it was just doing whatever I wanted it to do. But now you're going to have to fight the land. Because the dirt is cursed. How many of he didn't even curse man, he cursed the dirt. So the work became harder, and he had to work by the sweat of his brow, because the dirt was cursed. Now I'm going to show you something about that that's going to blow your mind. Remember these words. The dirt is cursed. Darkness is setting in all around us. And if you did not know it, let me help you. It is not getting any better. It's going to get worse. I'm not talking about you. I'm not talking about us. Because this is going to get better in here. It's going to get better in here. It's going to get better in my house. I'm talking about out there. I'm just one of them preachers that's going to tell you the truth. We got too many out there that's too scared to tell the truth. It's going to get better in the spirit. It's going to get worse in the natural. We are driven and live, and live by the spirit, but we live in the natural. And the only way to overcome the natural is to live in the supernatural. See, when you understand the moment, you understand how difficult the job is. I remember my granddaddy, and you've heard it all your life, of a, of a statement that's made in the secular world and in the natural world when it comes to work. It would go something like this. If it was easy... Everybody be doing it. But everybody ain't doing it because everybody don't want to do the work that it's going to take to get it done. Now, there's people that want to reap the benefits of the work. They want to buy the product of the work, and then they want to get mad at you when you get wealthy. <laughs> they want to get mad at you when you get a new car and you get a new house. And y'all went to the same high school together, used to pray together in the altar, and all of a sudden you blessed. Why ain't they blessed? But the truth is, they were not willing to do what you did to get where you're at. Oh, this is good preaching. Now that's in the natural. And I know in the spirit we can't earn anything. But let's talk about a few things. You shall lay hands. Upon the sick, and they. But what if you don't lay hands on them? Now, I know that God can still heal them, but on a mass scale, would you not agree that if God gave us a specific command on how to transfer the healing power of God, and then all of a sudden an entire generation stops doing it, He could still heal people, but the number of healings are going to go down dramatically because the people of God are not doing the work. How about this one? In my name, they shall cast out devils. The reason demons are taking over pulpits, the reason demons are taking over churches, the reason demons are taking over nations is because the church is not doing the work. They're not casting the devil out. They're not walking in the authority that God gave them. Demons tremble, baby, at the name of Jesus. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost up in here. You better learn how to do the work of casting out a devil. And if you don't know what that is, that's called the Holy Ghost. C. 
See, when you understand the moment, then you know in the moment, unusual things are going to happen and you're going to see them. But here's the kicker. You are going to be asked to do unusual things. Unorthodox, strange. Jesus says, so you're blind. How long you been blind? They, from, from my birth, I've never seen religious people immediately speak up. Not just religious people, his people. Because they don't get it yet. And they said, well... Who sinned for, them, for him to be blind? Surely we've got someone to blame for the blindness of this poor man. Was it his parents? Was it his grandparents? Who did this to him? Jesus starts dropping revelation. They don't even get it. Man, Jesus was awesome, y'all. You don't understand. Jesus was intentional with every single word that came out of his mouth. Yeah, yeah. Nothing just came out to come out. He didn't just say something. Because he knew what he was saying. Many of the things that he was saying. Not, not, number one, watch this. Let me tell you how awesome Jesus is. The Bible says in the book of John that if everything he did was recorded, there wouldn't be enough room to even store the books of what he did in three and a half years. So you know what that tells me? That tells me there are thousands upon thousands of acts of Jesus and miracles that he did knowing no one would ever know about them except that one person. He said, man, I'm the King of kings, the Lord of lords. I'm starting a new way of life. I'm, they're going to start counting time over because of me. All over the world, they're going to start churches in my name. They're going to sing songs about me. I'm about to print the best-selling book, and nothing ain't ever going to outsell that book, all of that stuff. But you know what? I care about you, Susie. Your name might not make it in the book, but it don't matter to you right now, does it, Susie? You got leprosy, Susie. Today, Susie, you're going home clean. That's my God. Now, oh my God, are you hearing me? You may not know who Susie is, but Susie knew who Jesus was. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> he said, listen, y'all need to get this. And nobody's sin. This ain't nobody's fault. This is the devil. You're going to understand who our enemy is. It ain't his mom and daddy. It ain't what side of the tracks he was born on. He said, it's, it's gonna blow, it just blows your mind. Because I don't want to misquote it. It says, that the works of God should be revealed in Him. See, the works of God is not about people seeing you do them. When you work for God, you ain't working for people to know that you're working. So that people can brag on you working. So that you can take an Instagram. Look at me doing the work of the Lord. He said, no, 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 no. The works of the one who sent me. People don't even know it's the works of God. Just because I do it. I could do and say anything. But here's how you know, you'll know that it's the works of God and not the works of man. They will be revealed in Him. Not in the one that's laying the hands on the sick, but on the sick. The works of God are revealed not because you spoke into somebody's life and laid hands on them for their healing, but the works of God is revealed through you when the sick gets healed. Oh, y'all ain't hearing me? Y'all ain't hearing me. Somebody shout, I'm hearing you. I'm hearing you. Okay. Y'all know that's just preacher talk. I know you're hearing me. But 
You know, we say things. We're trained. I wish I had a church. I wish I had a church that would help me preach. <laughs> wow! See, some of y'all need me to do that to believe I'm preaching. See, if it doesn't sound like I'm going to die at any moment, that my lungs are shutting down and I've lost all capacity to breathe, and I'm, then you don't think I'm anointed. I used to do that, and then I almost actually fell out because I was causing myself to faint. Watch this. Okay, here we go, here we go, here we go. I'm almost through with my introduction. He says, I'm going to show you the works of God revealed into him. They're like, okay, here we go. Here we go. He's about to speak to him and tell him to open his eyes. Next verse. Woo! Verse 6. And when he had said these things, somebody say, said these things. He said these things, got their attention. He spat on the ground. And made clay with his spit. Now you got, can you imagine being the ones watching that? Now, it did not bother the blind man. Are y'all hearing your pastor this morning? First of all, he couldn't even see what he's doing. He thought he's just spitting a loogie. He thought he's thought he about to spit a word. He wants to get his chest cleared first. Here it comes. He had no idea that loogie that he just spit out. I'm trying to paint a picture for y'all. That sounded like he's just clearing his throat. He was in that moment. He started hearing people around because he's blind, remember? He started hearing people around going, what is he doing? Blind man's going. What? What? What's he doing? What's he doing? Jesus down there going. Man, he wet enough. He just made. He just making a mud pie with spit. Now this is what we preach. These are the words that preachers use. And he took the mud. Everybody say the mud. Look at me. He took the mud and he rubbed it on his eyes. That's not what it says. Put that scripture up here and let me show you what it says again. When he said these things, he spat on the ground and made. Made what? Clay. With his spit, what does spit come out of? Mm. <laughs> and then he rubbed it. He what? He anointed the eyes. So much is in right there that we've never seen. That hit me like a ton of bricks. The first thing you got to see is Jesus is so big picture. And I've told you this a hundred times. If you want to understand the heart of God for you, just go back to the garden. Yeah. Everything he desires for you, he gave Adam in that garden. Everything. Everything we're dealing with now is because of what Adam and Eve relinquished. They had everything that God would ever want for them. So God's so big picture. I believe that God knew, and I believe that Jesus knew over 2,000 years ago, standing before a blind man who had been blind from birth, a simple story in Scripture. 
So much was going on in that moment that no one knew. And I believe so much was going on in that moment that generations of preaching have missed. He's, how many knows that Jesus, and he proved this, he could have just simply said, open your eyes. Did he not speak to people? Take up your bed and walk. He touched some people. Some people touched him. Sometimes he just spoke it. He had the power to speak healing to that blind man. Why in the world would he do something so unusual? The first thing you've got to get, put that scripture back up. The first thing you've got to get is that when he said these things, See, you must always remember that when God says something, it is creative. He is the Word made flesh. Jesus is the manifestation of the Word of the Trinity. So he first speaks a spiritual principle. Because you can't do Miracles in the natural world unless you've got a spiritual word on it. So he gives them the pattern. He says, first, before I do anything else, I need everyone to know the enemy is not his parent. The enemy is not anyone in the flesh. The enemy, you will get it soon, is my enemy as well. I've come here to destroy his works, and I've come here to teach you how to do it. Y'all know that scripture that everybody likes to quote? All things work to the good. Well, you didn't quote the whole scripture. All things work to the good to them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. First John says this, for this purpose was the Son of God manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. So he speaks it. And while he's standing there right now, now I move into a gospel according to Larry. Now I move into my opinion of interpretation. Can't prove this. But it sort of makes sense to me. And I think it might make sense to you. He hears that. He speaks that principle. And he looks down at the dirt. There's something about Jesus and the dirt. What about the woman who was caught in adultery? Huh? While all the religious people th throwing out all these accusations, for some reason, he keeps getting drawn to the dirt. Next thing you know, Jesus just sort of kneels down and just starts taking his finger and carving something in the dirt. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. We don't know what he said. It don't matter what he said. We don't matter what he wrote. All I know is either because of what he wrote or because of the anointing that was on him when he was writing, one by one they started dropping the rocks, didn't they? But the conviction came on the men accusing when he put his hand in the dirt. See, when he was looking at the blind man who was blind from birth, he spoke something in the natural, and then he, he looked at the dirt. And I believe the mind of Jesus went back to Genesis when it all began. Now I'll ask you a question. The Bible says that when God made man in the garden, he fashioned him with his hands from the clay. Because you can't mold dirt, but you can mold clay. Clay has to be wet to mold it. So how did the hands of God mold Adam from the clay of the earth without moisture? Now, I know there were rivers in Eden that he could have scooped his hand out. But he ain't going to make man and put water 
O man, make man moldable from anything natural. He took the only thing that was natural to make it, but in order to make it pliable, he needed moisture. It is of my opinion that when he illustrates the famous story of the mud, as what we call it, the mud in the eyes of the blind man, he was literally recreating the moment of creation of man. He spat on the dirt. I believe in the garden. If he breathed life into man, if he breathed blood into man, why in the world would we not think that he would spit on the dirt of the garden? Y'all ever heard anything like this before? I hadn't either. He spits, and he keeps spitting until he has a consistency of clay. And he holds it up in his hand. The same hand. The Bible says everything that was created was created by him, and nothing was created that was not created by him. I believe for just a moment. He's thinking about what they don't realize is the work that I came to do. Bigger than this blind man. The work I came to do is to take them back to when I did this the first time. And the only way they'll ever get it is they have to have their eyes open to the moment. So he takes the consistency of the clay, just like you would take a bottle of extra virgin olive oil in a church service and use the most unorthodox thing, not to rub mud on somebody's eyes for shock value, but to literally tell the dirt that he cursed. Your curse that I spoke over you it's not bigger than me. I'm the one that cursed you, and I can take something that's cursed, but when it gets in my hand, oh my God, y'all ain't hearing me. I'm about to fall out right now. The world can call it cursed. But when I spit on it, when I speak on it, when something comes out of my mouth on it, and I take my hand and I grab it, what the world called curse becomes anointed. (laughs) And he anoints his eyes. With the anointed clay. But I ain't even got to the big part yet. That blew my mind by itself. But the next part is what absolutely blew my mind. And I knew that this was a message for this generation. Are you ready? Notice. He anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. Next verse. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And I love it when the word of God interprets itself to make sure. See, when God does that, that's, that's, that's times when God is saying, I don't even want you to worry about having a strong concordance. I'm going to go ahead and skip the process for you and, and, and tell you what strong says. Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Mmm. He literally manifested the command to work in that day by spitting on the ground and making clay mud. 
the work of that moment and the work of our moment is always people. It's not buildings. It's not social media followers or subscribers. It's not television programs and mailing lists. The work is people. A few things you need to get about the symbol of this on this moment, as I've just said. And you may want to write a couple of these quick down. I'm going to review what I've already said. The ground is cursed. He spits on the curse. He makes an anointed clay with formerly cursed dirt. Do you know what the Bible says? Dust, we came into this world, and dust shall we return. Do you know what the word Adam means? It means red dirt. It means dirt. Man means dirt. That is why he looked at the serpent when he cursed the serpent and said, you will eat of the dust of the earth. He was telling the devil, I know how you will feed yourself. By biting and injecting and attacking mankind that are made of dust. He wasn't speaking of dust in the dusty ground. He was talking about us. But he says, you're going to devour the dust, man, Adam, dirt. You're going to think that you have consumed them. And one day, you're going to be so full of yourself, you're going to latch your fangs into the ankle of another dirt man. Who the, who the Bible says, Adam was the first Adam. Paul says, Jesus was the final Adam. The first Adam got messed up with a conversation in, the, in a tree. The final Adam crushed his head while hanging on his own tree. Do you see how things go full circle? Now watch this, I'm, I'm closing. Watch this. He anoints the eyes of the blind man with cursed dirt. But the moment it comes in his hand, it becomes anointed. Look at your neighbor and tell him, get in his hands, and you'll be anointed. Listen, these people have said, well, I'd come to your church, but bless God, the roof would fall in if I came in. That's a cop out. Because I'm going to tell you, I don't care what you've done, what you've said, who you slept with, what you shot up, what you snorted. I don't even care what you shook your fist at God and called him. He can take it. You can't say nothing to God that God can't forgive if you ask him. He'll take a devil worshiper that's got a pentagram tattooed on his forehead that last night sat in the middle of a bunch of candles and asked the devil himself to possess him. The next day, somehow, some way, somebody might lock, lock him up and have a relationship with somebody in Jesus, and they tell him about the Lord, and God can anoint that old dirty, wretched, devil-worshiping and make him anoint. I've seen preachers stand in the pulpit preaching the gospel with tattoos of pentagrams on them. Faces of the devil that they ain't had time to pay somebody to cover up yet. But Jesus said, you know what? I don't need you to cover it up. If you want to, that will be good. But watch this. I can anoint you with a devil tattoo on your arm. I can anoint you with a pentagram on your head. Because you ain't cursed when you're in my hand. I'm losing my voice, y'all. i got to be able to shout tonight. Pray for me. <clears throat> hmm. Is this a good word? I told y'all. Here we go. Here we go. 1136, if you take a mess. Lord knows we want you to take that pill. You might go crazy if you don't. I heard you, Ruby. That's an inside joke with me and Ruby. Now watch this. He says, go. Get up. Now watch this. The blind man cannot see what he just. I'm sure he heard people. 
There's no doubt in my mind somebody probably screamed to him, dude, he took the ground and put the mud in your eyes. I cannot for the sake of me believe that at that moment that he was sent to the pool to wash his eyes, that somebody hadn't told him, you got spit mud on your eyes. Now, we hear that story, and if we heard somebody say, my God, he just spit and rubbed his spit, because we ain't thinking about the dirt and we ain't thinking about the clay. All we're thinking about is the spit. We're feeling that slimy. Well, this is Jesus. He did not have, he didn't have nasal congestion. His, his saliva and spit would have been perfect and clear. Maybe. But he was tempted in all manner like his of us. Maybe he didn't get sick, but he probably spit a loogie. I mean, how can you be human without spitting a loogie once in your life? He did all the other stuff that we don't like to think about Jesus doing. Huh? How many knows? You get up in the morning, you drink a cup of water. Water's got to come out. You eat some lamb. Lamb's got to come out. Nobody wants to think about Jesus going to see a man about a dog. <laughs> but here's the reality. There were times that Jesus was preaching because he preached all day long. There were times that Jesus said, Everybody hold what you got. I'll be right back. Right? So all he's thinking about is the spit. And he's like, okay, okay, okay. He's about to get this off of me. And then he hears something even crazier than knowing he just rubbed mud on my eyes. He says, now... I want you to get somebody to help you because you're blind and you can't see your way. Somebody's going to have to help you. Take you to the pool of Siloam. No other pool. Notice he didn't say go find some water. Listen, God was very specific. He called the name of the place that he must wash. He says, you go to Siloam. And you wash there. And then you let me know what happened. So several principles you got to get. Many times you can have a word on something. But you might not make it to your miracle without somebody helping you get there. This world that says they don't need the gathering. This world that says they don't need the church anymore. There are things that you can get by yourself at your house, but there are places that you'll never be able to go. You know why? You're blind. You can see some things, but some things you can't see. And there's no way you know how to get there. But God will assign someone with you to take you where you need to go. So we don't know who that person was or persons. They're unnamed. They're, un, they're not even talked about. But we know that he had to have helped to get there because he was still blind. And now watch this. As he's walking, we don't know how long it took him to get there. The sun began to dry the clay. And the moisture and the moment of the miracle and the unusual crazy church service that he was just in begins to dry. How many times have we ever been in a place where we felt God's presence on us and we made commitments to God and we believe that God made commitments to us only to walk out on that journey and it not happen as fast as we thought and we began to feel dry? Still got the promise on us, still got the word in us, but it is not as fresh as it felt earlier. Come on, are you hearing me? It don't feel like the moment anymore. In fact, somewhere along the journey to the pool of Siloam, he could no longer hear the voice of Jesus. He was now walking on assignment, and Jesus was nowhere to be found or seen. It felt like he had been forsaken by God. You ever been on the journey looking around for God, 
and you don't think you can find him anywhere? But what he forgot was he didn't need Jesus to stand there. What he needed from Jesus was the word that he had got from Jesus. See, the word stays with us even when we can't see him or feel him. He sent his word and healed them. So at some point on your way to Siloam, you're going to have to walk out of emotion and walk in on the word. What was the word? And I'm closing. Go to the pool of Siloam. Now, if he would have just stopped right there, the pool of Siloam, knowing how I am, I would have probably still looked up Siloam. And I would have found out that it meant sent. It would have still been powerful. But when I was reading it, just like you could read it, just like anybody that knows nothing about God, that's never read the Bible in their life, could read this story, and they, God made sure that every single person that would ever read this scripture knew exactly what Siloam meant. Would you not say that's pretty intentional? So I begin to realize it is just as important to know that Siloam means sent than it is to know that Jesus spat on the cursed dirt and it became anointed in his hands and anointed his eyes and all the famous story about the mud. We focus on the mud and we forget and we miss the most important part of the entire revelation. He says, in order for you to get this miracle, I need to teach people something that one day people will get that one of the greatest concepts of this thing that I'm going to create and start that you don't even know anything about now called the church is the word sent. The first thing, the first command that comes to the to the mud-eyed man is go. Now, does it not make sense in the natural and our grammar to just simply say, well, of course it's called sent because we have been sent by God because He told us to go. Go into all the world and preach the gospel, right? So therefore, we have been sent. Of course, it means that. But then this is what dropped in my spirit, these words. He sent him to sin. He could not see until he was sent to sin. And when he got to sin, sin, S-E-N-T, not sent. When he got to sent, Salome, something happened in the sent and with the sent that released the miracle for him to see. And I realized here's why you don't see miracles in the modern church. Because we want to preach about the mud and the anointing of Jesus on the eyes. But we don't want to receive the concept of scent. See, you ain't there yet. You don't know where I'm going yet, but you're about to. I want to remind you that the work of God, somebody say do the work. Was Our work is the work that he did. Remember, he said these works I must do. Remember when he walked into the temple in Luke chapter 4? I'm not going to read it. You know it. He walked into the temple. When he began his ministry, he found the book of Isaiah. He opened up the book of Isaiah. He, found, he didn't just open it up and plop it out. He, the Bible said he found the place where it was written. Intentional. He read the messianic prophecy of the Messiah. And he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. I have, that means I have been anointed. The very next words, because he has anointed me. Do you know what the word anoint means? To smear. 
He has smeared upon me. Here's what he smeared upon me. Preach the gospel to the poor. Set me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. He was simply carrying out what the Messiah was to do. But the Messiah was not promised to come just to save Israel. The Messiah, they didn't realize it, was prophesied to come to give us access to the garden again. Are y'all hearing me? Is that devil trying to stop this recording? Can y'all hear me good out there? Because I ain't letting the devil stop this thing. Watch this. So listen, listen, I'm almost through. Here's the problem with this society. We are woke, but we are still asleep. See, you are not woke. You know why I've been preaching that? Why in the word you got quiet after four weeks of me preaching what I've preached and you're still scared to say amen to it? I don't care how that word originated. That ain't the word I'm talking about right now. Because the world uses that word to encourage you to believe everything you can except God. God has not called you to be woke. He's called you to be awake. He's not called you to be blind. He's called you to see. So he said, it'd be one thing if I allowed the natural moment to open your eyes. But see, son, I'm going to use you to teach a principle that the last generation is going to need to get. Because there are going to be a lot of people claiming that they can see, they can see, they can see. But all they had was an experience and they're running around with mud on their eyes. Thinking that what they see. How many of those when you close your eyes you can still see things? Just gets dark. How many of those, all of us has got little worms flying around inside our eyelids. We didn't know it until we closed our eyes and all of a sudden you see them little worms. You know I'm kidding, they're not real worms, I don't think. They may be, but sometimes I see little, I'm like, what is that? I'll, I'll crack, you ever cracked your eyes just barely open? All of a sudden you, just, you think you're seeing in the spirit realm. Woo, yeah, I've got an experience. I've got an encounter. It's all about me. It's all about my flesh. It's all about the things that I want. Blind. Now watch this, watch this. Go wash in the pool of Siloam. So he went and he washed and he came back seeing. Hold up. It's 11.50. You ain't got to go there, but listen to me. It's going to sound like, what does this have anything to do with what you're talking about? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. Jesus, the Bible said, he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. Why is that important? Because you need to understand what the word apostle means. When you look up the word apostle in the Hebrew, or excuse me, in the Greek, it is the word apostolos, which means an ambassador of the gospel commissioned by Christ, one that is sent. In other words, number two definition is simply the word sent. Apostle means sent. He sent him to the apostolic. Salome represented the apostolic. When I'm gone and I can't do this for you anymore, I need you to know there is a place you can go. I'm going to raise a apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. What are, they're all the hand of God, the five fingers of God. That when you allow yourself, your curse, and your life to be put into the hand. 
It's of God, not of man. But let the gifts of the Spirit connect in your life and pour into your life. Your eyes will be open to see things. Does anybody feel like your eyes are being open to see something right now? It's because in this house with this microphone, the scent is speaking. I'm not talking about me. It ain't about me. These are revelations that God gave me. But then he sets the office of the sent one, the apostolic, in the house to make the house the pool of Siloam. This is the pool of Siloam. How do you know it's the pool of Siloam? Because the apostolic is here. The scent is here. I don't need you to call me apostle. I'm not changing my name. I don't need you to dress me and uh, come up here and wipe my sweat and do all this kind of crap for me that you see some of these preachers do. I ain't saying nobody can ever carry my Bible. You can carry my Bible if you want to. But you know what? If you don't want to, I carry my own Bible. I can still open the door. I don't need you to open the door for me. If you want to, I'll appreciate it. If you don't open the door for me, I'll just look at it and say, God bless you, and I'll open the door myself because I am just a man. But right now I'm anointed. I've been smeared upon. And I realized that the miracle happened in the apostolic. And the reason you don't see miracles happening is because people will not embrace that God can use a man to flow in the apostolic the way he does. And because people have abused it, men and women have abused the office and turned it into controlling spirit, people are afraid of the gift. But you don't need to be afraid of the pool because that's the place where you're going to get your healing. Everybody's looking for a style. They're looking for a a dress style of the preacher, a, a style of the music. Some of them are looking for the color of the preacher's skin. Some are looking for this, that, next, trying to find what kind of church they want to visit. Well, I'm telling you right now, the remnant, they're not looking for style. They're not looking for color of skin. They're not looking for style of music. They're not looking for lights. They're not looking for screens. They're looking for Salome. They're looking, they're looking for a place where they can get washed. They're looking for a place where they can see, where they can go from woke to awake. Let me show you what happens. Has this been good preaching? I'm through, but I'm going to show you something. Well, if you're going to show me something, you're not through. <laughs> Work with me. This is what happens when raw unchurched people have an encounter with a mud dirt experience with Jesus. He didn't know nothing about church. He didn't know nothing. He'd never been able to read a single scroll. All he ever knew about anything about God was what somebody told him. And when you're blind like that from birth, you're cursed. So chances are he didn't have nobody telling him nothing about God. So he, in fact, everybody had probably told him, you're like this because of your mom and daddy, and had turned his heart against his own mom and daddy. He, he had probably left his family. He was isolated. He had no one. He didn't know nothing about God. All he knew was he felt something happening inside of him, and that clay hit his eyes. And he heard the voice of the one that said it, go to the place called sin. What you do after that is up to you. And Jesus went on with his ministry. He didn't stand there and wait. He didn't, he didn't say, y'all send me a text and make sure he, he's coming back. Make sure when he comes up out of the water and he sees, tell him to immediately go to my YouTube channel and click subscri subscribe and give me a thumbs up. Share my podcast. He didn't know that. He just went on about doing the work. So while he's doing the work, he hears, hey! 
Ain't nobody helping him. Ain't nobody guiding him. He is sprinting. Hey! Stop! What is it? Oh, my God, I can see! You can what? I can see. Jesus says, great, awesome, got to get back to work. All of a sudden, here's what the religious people do. Wait a minute, hold up a minute. We've been tricked. It's the Bible. They grab him. I'm not going to read it, but it's the rest of the story. Just go back and read the rest of the story. The next verse is right after. This is literally what happens right after this moment when he comes back from the pool of Siloam. They grab him and they take him to the temple. They bring him immediately before the priest. They're like, something demonic has happened here. They said, what's happened? They said, we're not 100% sure. He, this is literally what it says. It looks like him. This literally is in your Bible. People start coming up and saying, is this the guy that was blind from birth? And people start saying, well, I'll be honest with you. It looks a lot like him. But I'm not going to say it's him because the only state I've ever known him is blind. And I've never seen him smiling. And I've never seen him dancing. And I've, ne I've never seen him act like this. So I don't know if it's him or not. Woo! It's my last word here. This, what ha this is what happens when God starts using rough, redneck, backwoods, unschooled people to get a hold of God. The priest stands up in all his authority and says, Well, spit. I love this the way it says it. He says it to the former blind man, the priest, the, high, the, the, the judge, the Sanhedrin says, Give glory to God. This is what he says. That'd be enough for, it sounds like, oh, yeah, give glory to God. No, he says, give glory to God and tell us all that the man that did this is a sinner. Glorify God right now by calling this Jesus a sinner. Because the Bible says something wild. It says, because he spat on the ground and put the mud on the eyes of the man on the Sabbath. On the Sabbath. They said, we don't care if you are blind and you can see now. Give glory to God. Call this man a sinner for what he's done to you. He goes, this is in your Bible. He says, I don't, I don't, I don't know if he's a sinner. This is, this is how it reads, y'all. He goes, well, what is he and who is he? The man says, somebody says, you think he's a prophet of God? He said, yeah, I'm, I think he's a prophet of God. Pretty sure he is. This is raw, y'all. This is literally what your Bible says. This is just raw. He goes, well, let me ask you this. Is he the Messiah? Is he the one that he says he is? And you couldn't write a better answer. From a raw, blind, miserable, wretched, been put down your whole life, ain't never seen nobody, response. He literally looks at the most powerful religious force in all the world. He goes, huh, is he the Messiah? Is he who he says he is? He said, well, I ain't been to seminary. I don't know. I don't really know if he is who he says he is. But this one thing I do know. I once was blind. But now I see. <laughs> oh! oh! I do that. I don't even care who he is. I believe anything it tells me. Whoever he says he is, I'll tell the world that's who 
who he is. Because when I woke up this morning, I was blind, but I ain't blind no more. Somebody give him praise. Somebody give him praise. You once were blind. Somebody give him praise. Everybody stand. See, that's what you're going to get. There are going to be people saying, look, I, I can't give you no theological answer. I can't give you scripture and verse. But I can tell you this. Before I went to that church, my marriage was over. I can tell you this. I had been served the, the divorce papers. I was going to lose everything. God got a hold of me and my wife. I can't explain it. I don't know anything about that preacher. I don't know anything about that church. But I can tell you this. When I got up this morning, my marriage was over. We laid down in the bed tonight. And we're talking about we're going to make it. We lay in there tonight and say, we're going to make it. We're going to be used by God. All I know, all I know, I don't know if that's the greatest church in the world. I don't know if that's the greatest preacher in the world. All I know. So I got a word in that church. There's something came on me in that church. Somebody spoke something in my life in that church. The God came out of somewhere, just hit me. I repented of my sins. I felt something come on me. And I, all I know is this. I ain't never drove home where I didn't stop by the package store on my way home. But for some reason, I didn't even think about the package store. I was already in my driveway. And I realized I don't need that alcohol. I don't need those drugs. I don't need that pornography. All I know is I... I know what I was, and I know what I am right now. I ain't perfect. I ain't got it all together. But can't nobody take this from me. I can see. Is that you? You got mud on your eyes? Scaly, cracked and dry. Dry on the inside. A long time. And you felt the presence of God. Go to the pool. Don't worry about the time right now. The altar. It's the pool of Siloam right now. Come and find you a place in the pool of Siloam. In the apostolic anointing of God that's in this house. Come on. Come on. Come on. The scales are falling. The mud is falling off your eyes. Your eyes are opening. Oh, when you come up here, you come straight up with your hands up. You begin to open your mouth and pray in the Holy Ghost. Some of you are about to be refilled with the Holy Ghost as soon as you walk up. The water is being stirred. I can't see you. My God, the water is being stirred. The pool of Siloam. The sit, the sit, the sit. You've been sent to the sit. You've been sent to the sit. The altar is here. The glory is here. Wash, wash. Wash, 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 wash in His Word. Wash in His glory. Wash in His presence. Wash. Your eyes are being opened. You're going to see things clearly. You're not going to see things anymore the way the world tells you to see them. You're going to see in the spirit realm. You're going to see visions. Visions are being unleashed in your life. Purpose. You're going to see your marriage healed. You're going to see your body healed. You're going to see that cancer leaving your body. You're going to see that, that depression being broken. You're going to see yourself smiling again. You're going to see yourself when you leave the pool today. You're going to see yourself praising God. Open their eyes, God. Open their eyes, God. You don't need no man to touch you today. Jesus has touched your eyes. And he has sent you to the pool to wash. 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 Wash your past away. Wash that guilt and shame away. The way it's washed is through repentance. Repent to God. Give it to God. Confess it. Bring it out of the darkness into the light. 
expose it. Break that addiction now. Pornography broken in the name of Jesus. That lying spirit broken. Broken in the name of Jesus. That manipulative spirit broken. Generational curses that's been spoke over you. Oh, you're just like your mama. You're just like your daddy. Break those curses right now. Break them. Just because your daddy was an alcoholic don't mean you're going to be. Just because your mama was a drug addict don't mean you're going to be. Just because your mama and your daddy abandoned you don't mean you're going to abandon your children. Break those generational curses. Break them. Oh, yeah. It's nothing like the presence of God. It's nothing like the presence of God. Somebody get tell about Sunday. Go some of y'all hadn't spoken in tongues ever in your life. Speak, let the Holy Ghost speak to you right now. People are being filled with the Holy Ghost. Not just in this altar, out there in the audience. In the audience right now. Don't get on your phone. Don't be talking to nobody. Get in the spirit right now. You're being filled with the Holy Ghost. Come on, don't be worried about what people next to you are gonna think. Because when it hits you, it's gonna hit them. It's gonna go all the way down the aisle. My God, my God, begin to let the Holy Ghost speak to you right now. You need the power of God in your life. You need the gifts of the Spirit in your life. Let the Holy Ghost speak to you right now. We're not ashamed. We're not ashamed. Oh, Lord, I can't get about time. Heaven bless. She can't give us on that. I can't ever say tell about Sunday. Oh, my, 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 Build up your most holy faith. 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 Yeah, Baba, Sunday, Baba, Kanta, Baba. Sing it to the Lord a new song. Sing it to the Lord a new song. How do your belly, how do your belly shall flow rivers of living water? Out of your belly, out of your belly. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah. The gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. God is restoring the call on your life. He's restoring the call to ministry on your life. Doesn't matter what your age is. God's calling some people to preach in their 70s right now. I'm talking about they're in their 70s and older. God is calling them to preach the gospel. There's people in this room that was called to preach the gospel 20 and 30 years ago. And because of how life just turned, you have not preached in 20 plus years. God said, you think he called you to preach back then? He still ain't called you to preach. It's time for you to go tell somebody, I'm ready to preach the gospel again. Because he don't call somebody to preach the gospel and then take it back. The call of God. Ooh. I hear the Lord say there's a Caleb anointing on you. There's a mountain that you have yet to take. That all roads have brought you to this moment. And God said, I have not forgotten the mountain I promised you. You're going to take that mountain. And when you take it, your family's going with you. Hey, Michael, you're going to take your mountain. Caleb, take your mountain. Who my kata shut down?
Y'all glad y'all was on the front row today? Y'all glad? I was glad when they said it to me. This whole family has a mandate from God on it. This whole family, sons, daughters, grandchildren, it flows down from Caleb. And God would never give a mountain to Caleb if he didn't want all his family with him. He didn't take that mountain just so he could just stick a flag in the ground and say, I did it. He took that mountain for his children. It's time for the people of God in this house that know that God has called you to this house, into this, to this anointing, into this vision, to take ownership and to put a flag down, stick something in the dirt. Because the enemy has laid out a plan for every single one of you that call this your home to pull you away in this moment. Stick your flag in the dirt. Put some roots down. And say, look, I don't have to agree with everything. I don't have to believe everything that I hear. But I know that God has brought me here. And nobody's going to take me from this moment because... It ain't, and I'm telling you, it ain't about me. I'm not trying to build me up. I'm talking about this house is a salome to you. Not only the healing that you need, but remember what it's called, scent. When you come out of that water, you're sent. You don't get to stay in the water. When God tells you to wash in salome, it's not for you to go backstroke and float on a, on a, on a floaty. It's an agenda-driven. Go wash and see what happens when you wash there. Why does God give us the apostolic descent? To equip you to be sent. It's called sent because it's the anointing to sin. Not just because they've been sent. That's what modern preachers have tried to make it. That's how they've abused it. I'm the sent one. No, God placed me here to send you. And that's what this house is. It's going to send you.